Welcome to Indie Tech's in and in Focus. I'm Nicholas Reed. And I'm Alexandra Brawley. Years of practical evidence and a growing body of research demonstrate that family members and other caring adults play a critical role in the lives of young people involved with the juvenile justice system. There is increasing awareness of the fact that youth who maintain positive relationships with loved ones while incarcerated are more likely to address treatment needs, and they are less likely to be involved with the justice system after returning to the community. Strong relationships with family members and other caring adults are protective factors against delinquency and criminal behavior. Further, many adjudicated youth who are placed within supportive households fare better than those who are incarcerated. In this program, we'll explore the current state of family engagement in the lives of young people involved in the juvenile justice system and hear firsthand how partnerships between families and justice systems can make a difference in the lives of these youth. One organization working to build the research base around family engagement in juvenile justice is Avera Institute for Justice. Joining us today to talk about this work is Ryan Shanahan, a senior program associate in Vera's Family Justice Program. Ryan Shanahan, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm wondering if you can tell us more about Vera's Family Justice Program and how you started work in the area of family engagement in the justice system. The Family Justice Program is an outgrowth of La Bodega de la Familia, which was a Vera spin-off that became an independent nonprofit organization uh, that was a groundbreaking innovative program that partnered people on parole with case managers in, this, in the community that took a family-focused approach. And it was the first time that parole was thinking a little bit differently about the people who were coming home and transitioning back into their communities as being part of a larger family. And supporting that family and supporting the natural connections that person and the natural support that person had to their family. And we won an Innovation in American Government Award with our partner Parole from Harvard. And that got us a good amount of attention. And we knew that replicating La Bodega and what was happening specifically here in New York City wouldn't exactly work across the country. So instead we distilled the core tenets of our work, the principles of our work, and developed more of a training and technical assistance approach so that we could take what we were learning and what was working here in New York City and see where and how it could apply in other jurisdictions and in other venues. So. We started working a lot with parole and probation and then community-based organizations that were focused on reentry and how to be more family-focused in their reentry practices to make sure that people were meeting the goals successfully that they had for reentry. And then we started moving a little bit more further into the system and focusing on facilities. So detention centers and jails and prisons and long-term placement facilities for juveniles. And in 2009, Family Justice came back into VERA um, and was no longer an independent nonprofit, but was one of the programs of the VERA Institute, which is a larger nonprofit that's been around for 50 years and is organized by centers to partner with government and make justice systems more fair and more effective through research and innovation. So coming back to VERA allowed the Family Justice Program to expand on our capacity within training and technical assistance to also include research around um, the impact of family for people who are touched by the justice system. And how did that work grow into the work you're doing now focused specifically on juveniles and their families involved in the justice system? We were working with partners across the states about juvenile justice, and we got a large grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention in 2007 that really allowed us to take our juvenile justice work to the next level. And that grant was to develop a tool for corrections practice, juvenile corrections practice specifically, that allowed them to ask open-ended, non-judgmental questions about a young person's family and learn about their support system. So the Family Justice Program, whenever I say the word family, we're talking about family in the broadest definition possible. So anyone that the young person identifies as a support system is considered family for us. And we knew that in juvenile justice practice, in theory, People knew that family was really important, but in practice, staff had a hard time understanding how to incorporate that into their work. So this tool was developed to help staff take those first steps at 
communicating the value of family by asking questions in an open-ended, again, non-judgmental way. And that's called the Juvenile Relational Inquiry Tool. And what we found was that um, although the juvenile field was much more open to the idea of including family, there were certain things about the juvenile system that actually inhibited their ability to be really truly family focused. Part of that is the policies and practices that define family very narrowly, and the juvenile relational inquiry tool allows corrections, juvenile correction staff to ask about a broader definition of family and to identify a broader level of support, even if those policies and practices in the institutions don't afford the opportunity for that person to be an active, engaged member of, say, a monthly treatment team meeting or visit, there's opportunities that young people could be supported to start writing letters or to have monitored phone calls with this larger, broader array of support. We also found that with the tool, in conjunction with people who are incarcerated, being paired with a, someone who might be supervising them in the community, so for example, like a parole officer, that that parole officer having information about the largest sort of viewpoint of a support system for this young person could help them prepare for the young person's transition home. So that if they're finding out about an uncle, that uh, the parole officer in the community could then work with the uncle, talk with the uncle, and see how the uncle was going to help the young person meet their parole mandates when they came home. Whereas generally, historically, in these states where we were working with, parole would only deal with the parents. So it's really about getting the entire system from beginning to end to be thinking about a larger support network for young people because the research shows that when young people have a larger support system, they do better. It seems very intuitive, and the research that we're, that is building and growing is beginning to back that up. So that first project really catapulted us into a larger juvenile justice conversation, and we've continued to do that through our work across states and jurisdictions to help juvenile justice agencies think about the ways that they can develop and foster a culture that values families in their agencies and that their staff have the tools and resources and training to do that and that you capture the learning from that through research and evaluation. So reflecting on your work thus far, what are you and your team seeing out there in terms of level and type of family engagement with the juvenile justice system? I would imagine it's not always easy to engage families or for families to be as engaged as they might like. Family engagement is really important across the board from the time a young person gets arrested until, you know, if they're placed, that, that reentry and transition home. So while that is important, we see that the biggest challenge is when young people are placed with the state. What we see is that more often than not, because of resources, states have to centralize their placement facilities that, may, that are generally very hard for families to travel to. So part of our uh, engagement with states often starts with talking to staff and learning about how often young people can be in contact with their family members, and then surveying youth and asking them, how often are you in contact and how often do you get visits? And what we can often hear, and I think the conversation around this is changing, but in the past what I would hear from staff is the youth who don't get visits, it's because they've burned those bridges or those families don't want to be involved or they're lazy and they're just, you know, no good. And what we often will do is request contact information for the families that aren't able to visit. So we identify the youth who don't receive visits or receive very few visits, and we call home, and we ask the families to go through an interview with us. And what we have heard historically is that these families are burdened by travel, child care costs, health concerns that don't allow them to travel long distances, and the conversation sounds very different from the family perception perspective and the staff perspective. So part of our job is to try to merge those conversations, to educate staff about the challenges that families are going through, to draw out what staff know about those challenges, and then to 
really bolster that knowledge that staff have with direct information from families about what they need to ensure visitation can happen. Because what we hear all the time is that contact by phone and by video and by letter is great, it's welcomed, but by far families and young people prefer visiting in person more than anything else. And I imagine we can all understand that. Even as technology starts to grow and allows people to see each other through, you know, video chat or FaceTime, there's nothing like, you know, seeing your loved one in the flesh and blood and really being the ways that that can relieve any anxiety you might have about their well-being, whether that's for the youth who are worried about their families uh, in the community or the families who get to see that their loved one is doing well in the facility and meeting their goals. It also facilitates a very different conversation when staff can be involved in those visits and pass by and say, hello, you know, this is what your daughter or your son has done this month or this week and we're so proud of them or this is what they're still working on and how can you help and really using and tapping into the family to motivate young people to meet the goals of the facility and then really keeping that motivation strong as they go home. So I think that the biggest challenge is definitively around keeping young people in contact and keeping families not just in contact with their loved one, but with the staff and with the progress of their loved ones. But despite these challenges, Vera has, over the last couple of years, shared some of the successes of states and localities that are improving the ways the juvenile justice system and families work together. What are you most excited about in terms of what you're seeing in the field now? I'm really encouraged by states that are reflecting on placement practices. So states that are deciding to reimagine what their system could look like if young people were placed closer to home. So in New York, they had a policy shift where cities that were very large were able to keep their kids closer to home. So instead of the kid being placed with the state in one of four facilities, four to five hours away from the city, they were able to keep jurisdiction in New York City with those young people. So it took a lot of negotiation and a lot of trust building between the city and the state, but the results are, are really great. People are getting to stay closer to home. They have more contact with their family and their community and their school system. And I, I look forward to hearing the evaluations that I'm sure will be coming out in the next few years. So I hope that other states rethink the ways that they allocate resources and, the, and where young people end up when all other uh, paths have led to Placement. So if a kid has, you know, there's nothing we can do more for this kid, we have to place them, um, thinking about where that placement happens. I think the other best practices I'm seeing is that across the board, fam uh, agencies are starting to understand the value of visits and in sh trying to make visits as open and as accessible as possible for families. So, for example, in Indiana, they were able to very quickly go from fairly restrictive visitation policies where families had to figure out a schedule that was based on their first initial of their la you know of their last name and it was every other Saturday or every other Sunday and it was a fairly convoluted system and they just wiped it clean and they said just come visit whenever you want you know any time after the young person's out of school Three, time, three different times on Saturday and Sunday and come as often as you want. So it used to be that families could only visit once a week. Uh, they had to pick a day, the day, even if it was, they could make it both Saturday and Sunday, they could only pick one day. Now they can not only come Saturday and Sunday, they can come for all three shifts Saturday and Sunday. Um, so this is huge, you know, I'm making it more as Leanne Rizal from um, Washington, D.C. often says, you know, thinking about it like a hospital, like people should be able to come in and out um, when they please, and there should be the least restrictions as possible. So a lot of states will have policies wherein families have to call ahead of time, and um, if you don't call by a certain date and time, you can't come that Saturday. When families want the freedom to wake up on a Saturday morning and say, oh, 
my schedule freed up. I really want to go see my son or my daughter, and they should have the right to do that. And I think that part of what helped Indiana do that was that they just developed um, parent family councils. So it was groups of family members who were actively involved in their loved ones' lives, who were incarcerated with them, with Indiana, who wanted a voice at the table, and part of that voice really shaped these policies and practices. So the council was able to talk with people in Indiana about how often they wanted to see their kids and for how long, and that really shaped policy and allowed Indiana um, the ability to open up that visitation completely. And I see other states have similar policies. So all of the different ways that we allocate resources, there's so many opportunities there to show families that they're important and that they're the number one priority for these institutions and that they understand that the connection and the bond between a family member is not broken because a young person made a mistake or even made many mistakes, that this is still, you know, in the best interest of public safety is to keep this family together and that it's in some ways a shift in thinking about the responsibility of the juvenile justice system. Is a juvenile justice system's responsibility punitive in nature? Is it public safety in nature? And what part of keeping young people connected to their families is part of that responsibility? If you think of your job as being about public safety, and we know that kids do better when their families are involved, then how can we integrate that into people's thinking about their job and their responsibilities and their core values and mission statement in their system. Um, other best practices, the family councils are really important. I think that part of the work that Vera does is prepare agencies to really listen to families. And I think that there also needs to be another component, which is when families are being prepared to be at the table to, to speak. So those family councils are really important and also Justice for Families, which is another nonprofit, does a lot of work of developing capacity within family members to be advocates for their own use. And the way I like to think about it is that, again, you know, Vera is preparing, you know, family, sorry, Justice for Families is preparing families to be at the table, and the Vera Institute is preparing the table for families. So it's about working on both sides so that everyone can have productive and constructive conversations. So that's when I get really excited is when families feel really empowered and prepared and informed and that their voice will be heard and action will be taken. And when systems have their ears open, are listening without judgment and prepared to take action. Well, Ryan, I want to thank you again for taking time to speak with us today. I know you're going to stay on the line to answer some questions at the end of the program, but we appreciate you helping set the stage on this issue. Thank you for the opportunity. Research is just one part of this important issue. The real impact of families and justice systems working together and not working together is most clearly seen in the lives of the young people and their families involved with the system. Grace Bauer is one of those family members and her experience as a parent of a child involved with the justice system led her to help create and provide the type of support she wished she'd had the moment her son first got involved. Here's how it all began for Grace, her son Corey, and the rest of her family. We became involved in the juvenile justice system. Uh, it's been almost 15 years now. It doesn't, some days it seems like a lot more than that, and some days it seems a lot, le lot less than that. But um, my son was involved uh, Shortly after my mother died, he started to get in trouble at school, and then shortly after that, he got in trouble for stealing a pack of cigarettes from a little convenience store. Before that, he was an honor roll student and had never been any tr in any trouble at home or at school or anywhere, certainly not with the police. And within a month of my mom passing away, who he was very close to, he started to act out and get in trouble. We started off where, he, of course, he shoplifted the pack of cigarettes, and then he was put on probation, and or unsupervised probation, and then he skipped a volleyball pep rally one afternoon, and that got him on probation. And then shortly after that, he got in trouble at school for smoking, and so 
that got him put in the detention center for 10 days, and then another 10 days he was sent to the detention center, and another 10 days. And finally, after a year of um, this struggle, he was arrested with three other boys for stealing the stereo out of a pickup truck and was sent to the state. He was adjudicated delinquent and sent to the state for five years. He was 13 when that happened. Um, And today, Corey just turned 28, and he's doing a 12-year sentence in the state of Maryland for an armed robbery with a BB gun at the place where he had been working. And in the last 15 years, he spent more time in jail than out. When Corey first started acting out and came to the attention of the authorities, Grace didn't know where to go for the help and support her son needed, so she turned to any assistance she could find. And our first stop was the school system because that's where we, you know, I thought there was a counselor there and maybe there were things that the school system could help with. And the school system just told me that they didn't have the resources to be able to help. Um, And that if I needed more help, I would have to go to the juvenile justice system and ask for help there that they were experts and kids who were behaving badly. And that's where I should go. And... um, when he got involved in the system, I didn't really, I, I didn't know the answers. I thought that it was as the school had described, they were the experts on kids behaving badly. And I actually turned to the system for help with my son and thought that they would know better than I did. I had no idea that my asking for help would land my son in this kind of trouble, nor did I have any idea what the impact of him being involved in the system would be over the long term of his life, and it's certainly been the single most um, impactful thing that's happened in his life. In the years that followed Corey's initial adjudication and placement, Grace spent a lot of time scared and frustrated, and also angry, both with her son for his actions, but also with a system that she trusted to help, but was instead making things much worse. Grace didn't dwell on this frustration and anger, and instead became determined to find a better way, for her son and for the children of other parents like her. A lawyer connected Grace with a community group focused on juvenile justice issues, which in turn provided Grace's son, Corey, a youth advocate. The advocate not only helped Corey, but also helped Grace find her voice as an effective advocate for her own son. From there, Grace connected with other families going through what she was going through with the group Families and Friends of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children, or FLIC. After Hurricane Katrina, Grace and her family relocated to Maryland, and there Grace became aware of the lack of national-level efforts to help families involved with the juvenile justice system. It was then that Grace committed herself to changing that situation once and for all. And so we decided to, um, my uh, colleague Zachary Norris, who is now at the Ella Baker Center, came and asked me if if I was interested in starting a national parent organization, and I said yes, and through a Soros Justice Fellowship, we were able to write a report, um, Families Unlocking Futures, and um, start a a national parent network, which today numbers over 1,400 families all around the country. And so that's how Justice for Families came into being. In just three short years, Justice for Families has grown to unite thousands of families around the country to give families a powerful voice in the decisions affecting their children involved with the system. Justice for Families is also working toward total system reform that would see more young people receiving the services and supports they need at home and in the community, rather than simply put behind bars. In their work with families, Justice for Families focuses on three general areas. So at Justice for Families, we are there to hear families, number one, always to hear families, not to judge them, not to um, criticize them in any way, but to understand what's happened and what's brought them to this point and support families wherever they're at at that moment in time. And then our second step is to tell them what we know, that locking kids is up in cages. No matter how nice those cages may be is not the answer to this problem. There are alternatives, and let us tell you about the alternatives. Let us tell you what we know works, that the evidence and science says works. These are the things that we've learned. These are the things that the hundreds and hundreds, now over thousands of parents that we have worked with have found have worked. These are the things they have tried. You are the expert on your own child. You do not need a system 
to tell you how to raise your child. You actually know that. You know your child better than anyone else, and that system could possibly know your child. And then the third thing that we do is try to bring them into the larger struggle for system system reform. In this way, Justice for Families is working to make sure every parent has a spot at the table alongside justice systems, and that every family is prepared for that important role. In reflecting back on her early experiences with the justice system, Grace remembers how difficult it was to be heard as a parent seeking help for her child. In Calcasieu Parish, where I come from, I was invited to serve on the Children and Youth Planning Board. Um, which were just teams of people from, you know, the district attorney's office and the juvenile justice system and the school system and the mental health system and all of these different systems. And there was, you know, one parent representative on the board. And when I first started to go into that meeting, there were lots of conversations happening at that table that I didn't have an, uh, any idea about what they were talking about. I didn't understand anything. It was a very intimidating kind of process for me to learn to sit at that table and learn to do, you know, learn where I could be helpful and not just yell at the system people, but actually offer solutions. And it took a long time for me to be able to do that. And had I not had the support of Flick at that time, I'm not sure I would have remained at that table in the for all of the time it took me to learn. Because it was intimidating at times, it was degrading. Um, to hear folks around the table talk about families in this very um, negative way. And so I'm pretty sure that had I not had the support, I would have just got up and left and never gone back to those meetings. And while Grace acknowledges the very real challenges to strong family justice partnerships of distance and inflexible system policies, what rings most true for her is that, traditionally, the justice system has viewed families at worst as part of the problem and at least not as a vital part of the solution. If parents are defined, families are defined, and characterized by other people who come with biases and misconceptions about us, that it also puts up a lot of very distinct barriers between being able to work with families and not being able to work with families. It's not just the misconceptions and the biases. It's the barriers that get put in place. And to many people, they are invisible. But to us, we see it as a there's no open dialogue between families and systems. There can't be. Because if families speak honestly about what they're feeling or what they're seeing, their kid is going to be punished for it. There may be retribution against the child and the family. So you can't have that open, honest dialogue like that. Many times, a lot of our families want to do this work but they want to do it behind the scenes. They do not want to be the face of this organization. They do not want to be out front in their own community. So they are the people who write things. They are the people that make the calls behind the scenes. They are the people that help to organize. They are the, help, the people that help to get the food together for the meetings. But you'll never see them out there speaking. You'll never see them write an op-ed in a newspaper. And it is that fear of retribution. For Grace and Justice for Families, it's not about getting families at the table simply because they are parents and loved ones of the youth involved. It's because families are the ones that can offer the solutions that can make a real difference. We feel like the people that are the most impacted by the juvenile justice system or be it the criminal justice system or poverty or all of these things, those are the people that have the solutions and know what is going to work best for them in their own communities. They, they know their communities best. There has to be someone where the decisions are being made about how that money is being spent to say, wait a minute, that is not the answer here. That doesn't work. And I think the families are the ones that are in advocacy community are the ones that are saying that at those tables now. And I think the more that we get families into those positions to say those, you know, to be able to speak and speak honestly, be prepared to speak from their experience and be prepared to sort of be in those rooms, the more we will see the solutions that communities need being brought to those communities versus being sent outside of those communities in cages or programs that don't work or things like that. And it's because families know, and now the research is demonstrating the importance and the impact of strong family involvement and connections for youth in the system, that Justice for Families works as hard as they do to make strong family justice partnerships a reality. And Grace acknowledges the strides some jurisdictions they've worked with have made in this area. So there are a lot of places around the country, and I'll just speak to a couple of them. Um, New York, um, we first did a release of our report there in 2012, and we had the the head of department, uh, 
juvenile probation, and then the head of children and family services there at the release of the report. As a result of that event, they invited families in to be a part of their um, return home initiative. That's not right. Closer to home. Closer to home initiative. That's it. Um, They invited invited families to be a part. So now you have a decision-making body that is trying to decide about the future of juvenile justice and how we should take care of kids in New York. And for the first time, you now have families at that decision-making table who have been prepared to be there. And now, in um, just a short year later, the Bronx issued a $100,000 or $99,000 proposal for peer support for families in the Bronx. Our families were able to be there, write the, uh, you know, write the proposal, and and actually catch that money as it came down. And now they're providing peer-to-peer support services for families who are in the Bronx City Court. And in Chicago, we have a mom who is doing restorative justice circles with girls in the uh, who are involved in the juvenile court. Amazing project. And this is a mom who is retired. Her son has actually been in prison for over 20 years now. He's a juvenile life without parole case. But she works with the juvenile justice system, and just this week we're now putting in a proposal for her to go to do it in the school because she wants to catch them before they get there. Um, and... New Jersey. We have family members who are working to train system people on what it's like to properly and appropriately engage and partner with families. We're getting a lot of information out of that because of the discussion that's been had now. And it's also a place for us to be able to go and work with the families. We're able to go and work with the families there directly in Jersey and engage them. So now it's not a national group that's kind of in there running this. This is one local mom who is kind of just organizing the entire state and working with both sides, both the families and the system folks, to create a better relationship and sort of helping to lay the table for good discussions that are happening there. And and I think enough can't be said about the preparedness of getting folks ready to all sit at those tables together. With the increased impact at state and local levels and growing national recognition of their efforts, Justice for Families is poised to make the system transformation they're striving for. Grace admits that they're still a small organization trying to address a tremendous gap, but that won't stop them from taking the next steps necessary. Um, Next steps for Justice for Families as we're um, currently working on a project with the Annie Casey Foundation to do some projects with systems around the country, um, juvenile detention alternatives initiative sites, who are interested in partnering with families but just aren't sure how you do that. Need some technical assistance, need a little coaching maybe, um, need folks to be there to answer questions when they come up. So we're working with Casey um, to, to begin that work and we're looking, we're very excited about it. We felt like for a long time that the Flick model and then the Justice for Families model, which is based on the Flick model, um, we feel like that those are things that could work in systems. It's just we've never been given an opportunity to try it with a system. We've kind of always been on the fringes, right, trying to engage families from the outside. We're very excited about this opportunity to partner with families and, and systems from the inside perspective so that we can see what's happening and see what's causing families to be kind of shut out and where, you know, we could do things that would make things much different. We're very hopeful that in 2015 we will have a set of federal family engagement guidelines that will ensure that families' voices are heard at the state level, the county level, the city level, all of these different levels where decisions are being made. We want to see families a part of those. So if you have a state advisory group in your state, do you have families on that state advisory group? Do you have young people? People who are currently involved in the system and maybe just on the other side of being involved in the system so they have a little bit of a perspective. Um, Have those families had an opportunity to be trained up by other family members, such as us at Justice for Families or folks through mental health? Have those families had an opportunity to to get the preparation they need to to be in those roles, to know what's happening at those tables, and have the information they need to make good decisions and reflect what it is kids, families, and communities need? 
So those are our two big things for 2015, and of course we'll continue to work with families as they come to us around the country. We um, we really hate that there are not local organizations like ourselves in every state in the country. We would like very much to see that happen. But we're attempting to build that network ourselves um, through our other families who serve as support for other families, new families coming in. For Grace and Justice for Families, the time for real systemic change is now. For while improvements have been made, and Grace feels that she and other families can prevent situations like what her son went through and is now going through, there's far more that needs to be done. That we're coming to a place where we should be looking at what, if the remedies we are taking are harming children even more, what, what, what purpose do we serve? It not only harms the children more, it puts society at greater risk. So what is our purpose in all of this, and what should we be doing? And we should be looking at how do we help children before they get into these positions? How do we support families before they get into these positions? And we need to stop, start to stem the tide from the school system and the juvenile justice system into the adult criminal justice system. It's going to take long, strong leadership, strong federal leadership on this issue. I think they've done a good job with the My Brother's Keeper thing, starting that conversation, but it needs to go much deeper and it needs to go much faster. There is a sense of urgency among families out here. And we keep saying not one more, but then every day there are more. Not one more, but then every day there are more. So we're getting I want the federal government, I want all leadership to feel the same sense of urgency as if it was their son headed into the juvenile justice system today. And the odds that we know that that son would go on to be in the adult criminal justice system and that he will have a very poor chance at life and life successes. If leadership can see that from my perspective, or a mama's perspective whose child has already been there, there would be a much greater sense of urgency and we would move these things much faster. And we have the answers, we're just not moving fast enough to do the things that we know are right. So I would urge a greater sense of urgency. Treat it like it's your child in that system, even if you don't know that child and never seen them or their family. Just imagine if it was yours. The New Jersey mother Grace mentioned earlier got connected to Grace through their shared experience as parents of youth involved with the justice system. Tracy Wells Huggins, like many parents, found herself involved with the juvenile justice system quite unexpectedly one fall afternoon. So October of 2007, my son was walking home from school with a group of his friends. And he did what kids do when they see something happening. They get curious. And what he saw occurring was a fight across the street. And so him and three of his other friends walked over to see what was going on. You know, just basic inquisitiveness of the young mind. And what he didn't realize is that he would be face down on the ground within a very short period of time um, and then held in police custody for over three hours. I was never contacted. My son's father was never contacted. Um, my husband, his stepfather, had never been contacted during those three hours. So I'm kind of everybody's mom in my neighborhood. And what I did was when he wasn't home after a, you know, a significant point in time, I jumped in my truck and started riding around looking for him. Ran into one of my neighborhood sons and he said, Mom, Trace, I saw him in the back of the police car hours ago. So that was my first experience. And we rushed to the police station only to find that it wasn't only our son, but at least uh, 12 to 14 other young men of color that were being held in custody and questioned about this fight that was presumably um, a gang-related fight based on um, the words of the, the officer to me when I said I wanted to, you know, see what was going on with my son. And um, there was an officer that was very, very nice and said, you know, your kid had nothing to do with this. He was like a deer caught in the headlights. But because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and there is now a lot of gang activity in our area, he has to be charged as a potential gang um, affiliate, and you have to work it out in the court of law. The juvenile court system was never something Tracy thought she'd find herself involved with. After all, she'd worked hard to provide a good home and a nice life for her child. Her child should never be in the system, but he was. Tracy and her son were in court five times over the next five months, and that experience left Tracy very angry, frustrated, and feeling a bit lost. And she knew she needed to find help. So um, I started looking for resources in my community. And first, and I made myself a list, 
because I couldn't sleep at night. And the first thing I said on my list was that I needed other parents to talk to because I knew I couldn't be the only one. You know, there's no way that there are 12 to 14 other young men going through what my son is going through. And, you know, I would like to reach out to them to find out how they're feeling about this because from the fear to now the anger, there's got to be a way that we can get this out into the open. And looking for other resources and supports would have been significant. Every time I placed a phone call, I would get the same three questions. Are you on welfare? No. Uh, is there a division of youth and family involvement in your family? No. Uh, is your child already adjudicated? No. And based on those three criteria, we weren't even eligible for some of the services that did exist. So now, to add insult to injury, we're not poor enough, he's not bad enough, and our family's not dysfunctional enough to get any help before he gets deeper into the system. Finding that many of the immediate options available to her lacked the real answers and resources she needed to help her son, that's when, Tracy says, the trained nurse in her took over. In order for me to be able to deal with it, I said, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Where is the prevention dollars in my community? And so I started looking for things. And I started attending public meetings. I started going to my youth services advisory council, trying to find out what was available. I started going to the local family success centers, uh, looking for strengthening families programs. Hearing how her community and the systems at work in the community were looking at and attempting to help young people involved or at risk of involvement with the justice system left Tracy with the sense that more needed to be done. More needed to be done by working directly with the young people and their families and to create solutions that work better than what the system had to offer. And so I started talking to the boys during this five-month process from October to February. I asked their parents, would it be okay if I started talking to them about, you know, what they were facing, about how they were feeling about it, about making better decisions, about personal accountability, and Renewed Minds was born. Today, Renewed Minds is one of the fastest growing grassroots organizations in South Jersey, with a focus on providing advocacy, support, and education to at-risk youth and families. According to Tracy, Renewed Minds has grown over time and has changed to better meet the needs of the communities it serves. It has evolved to include gender-specific and gender-responsive services. And that allows us to have much more authenticity with the youth when we're dealing with them, both in the juvenile correction centers and when they come home into community-based settings. And another piece of that part of the puzzle was getting involved with Parents Anonymous, becoming a professionally trained facilitator, understanding that, you know, parents are natural leaders and they many times don't recognize that. And so we offer support groups for free to the parents under the evidence-based model of Parents Anonymous. Because the parents of kids who get involved in the system are often shamed into silence. And so we want to be able to provide a forum, first of all, for you to have solidarity, and second of all, to be able to have a venue where you are not judged so that you can talk about what you're dealing with and then help you to evolve and self-identify the leader in you and decide what you wish to do in terms of advocacy. Tracy is also the Associate Director of Justice for Families and still marvels at the strides families nationwide have made and the power that now exists behind their push for successful family justice partnerships, especially since her journey began seven years ago. Since that time, we've learned that the numbers of families who get involved, who have kids involved in this system, our voice has been silent for far too long. And so with us coming together from different parts of the country and having conversations, be it via conference call, be it um, at convening, we actually realize that, you know what? We can do something about this. We need to be heard. Uh, it's been a journey, and we have a lot of work to do, um, but it's gone from just us advocating for our child to everyone's children. It has gone from us not just speaking from our anecdotal experiences, but to us gathering data and finding partners to help us publish a report and to guide us along the lines of actually creating a powerhouse and dynamic national nonprofit with significant respect and, and um, 
and growth in the last three years. It's been a journey, and it all happened because that boy of mine wanted to see what was going on because he saw the scuffle. Since that time, there have been so many great strides that uh, we have been able to make as a movement because we know that the work that we're doing is important. We know that our youth, who indeed are our future, need to have somebody advocate for them. And we know that the only way that true change will come about is if we are seen as real partners in making this work um, of juvenile justice system reform take place. It's like I always say, we as parents are not going anywhere. And the sooner people realize that, the better, and especially when we can work together. Because at its core and at its root, family engagement is simply relationship building. It is putting our own implicit biases about one another to the side, and it's about how we can work together in order to have best outcomes, less incarceration, and build up better and stronger communities for our kids. Tracy's work alongside Grace and the other families involved in Renewed Minds and Families for Justice is having an impact nationally as more and more systems do what it takes to work with families and sustain the important familial and community connections youth in the justice system need. But Tracy still remembers and holds dear those people in her community she's been able to help as both a neighborhood mom and advocate. Shabazz Boozer is one of the neighborhood youth that Tracy came to know and be close to. Shabazz had a very different experience with the justice system than did Tracy's son. And his experience has shaped who he is and what he now wants to do with his life. Uh, well, my story starts out as, as far as I can remember growing up, um, my mother died when I was 10 years old and my father walked out. Um, I come from a family of eight, six boys and two girls. Um, after my mother died, we went to stay with my grandmother from Florida. And um, from there, I think that's like where everything really began. You know, at 10 years old, I actually had to become an adult. And... As the time went on, you know, like I said, I got eight siblings, so it was kind of hard reaching out to all of us and looking over all of us, you know, one human being, which being my grandmother. And from that being said, I got involved in, you know, the streets and, you know, the lifestyle of the fast lane uh, from, like, I think, like, 12 to, like, 14, 14 and a half, I was homeless, and then, like, 15, I got involved with a gang. I had a little gang involvement. Um, you know, still living the street life. And um, at 16, I got locked up for attempted murder and a first degree on robbery. And I was sentenced to four years in Jamesburg. That's the juvenile training school for boys of New Jersey. Um, I served 28 months and I came home. That's how I first got involved with the juvenile justice system. Like for many youth in the system, it was difficult for Shabazz to maintain connections with his family members and other caring adults while he was incarcerated. Um, my grandmother, she's one of them old fashioned type people. She don't do jails. Like she said, her kid never went to jail. She's not doing jail. So I really never had like the only time I seen my, my, my grandmother was um when I graduated. I actually got my diploma while I was incarcerated. And um they had a big ceremony and everything. We had a you know, regular graduation. And she, that was the only time she ever came up to see me. She said she don't do jail and things of that nature. My family, um, no, I didn't really have a lot of family support. Like, um, I remember I was locked up from 16 to 19. I only remember, like, two visits uh, other than my grandmother coming to see me for my grand uh, graduation and everything. And reflecting back on his time in the training school, Shabazz acknowledges how important a connection to his family could have been and how it might have changed his personal experience while incarcerated. Um, yeah, I think, you know, being incarcerated, you know, visitation is, 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 is a big thing because that helps a person get through their situation in a time period of whatever the length of the state that they have. And, like, people don't understand what, you know, after them visits, what people go through going back into themselves and back to the environment from, you know, the bullies that's in there to the CEOs that set you up to the gangs to the violence that's in there. And, you know, the visitations, it it, it gives you help and it gives you faith that, you know, you know, I mean, to keep you pushing through your time. And at the same time, you know, it, it like carries you 
it carries you along the way that you're there because, like I said, it gives you some type of sense of hope. And as far as, like, writing and pictures, like, that's the best thing because at the end of the day, it don't make you feel like you don't exist anymore. Like, everybody forgot about you. Like, so that, you know, that, that kind of, you know, messes with your mental because, uh, like, my brother, he died when I was locked up. He got killed at my house. And I had other family members, like aunts and uncles that was dying, and I couldn't see them or I couldn't be there. So, you know, that kind of messes with you. And it felt like kind of like the world was going to end before I came home. And, like, the family support would help me so much more. And I would got in less trouble and I think less incidents and altercations in there because of, you know, the support I would have had if I had someone from the outside, you know, supporting me. I think just with all the frustration and the anger inside, you know, once, you know, altercation happens inside, it triggers so many other things. And then, you know, it comes into a bigger situation. But I think with the family support and everything, when I did get visits and things like that, like it helped me out because I was looking forward to seeing my family the next week and looking forward to getting the good behavior to be able to get my mail and everything. Like, so yeah, definitely with, you know, people with the outside support definitely helps when you're in them type of situations. While he may not have had a strong connection to his family and community while he was incarcerated, Shabazz says he was fortunate to get involved in a reentry program that helped him not only overcome some of the emotional struggles he was facing and get his life in order, but connected him with positive, caring adults like Tracy, who were willing to give him a chance and show him how he could give back to the community. Once I came home, um, I went through all the stipulations and everything with parole and having to find a job and having 30 days to get a you know set residence and make sure I have an ID and you know set all them things that comes with parole and that situation and. From there, um, I got involved with a reentry program. Um, I was hired as a consultant. This lady came up with an idea to start a reentry program, and she wanted to involve youth that was already in the system so it would have a bigger impact. So me and three other guys, we um, agreed to be her consultants, and she trained us and everything. And, and then from there, um, I branched off. And I became my own independent contractor, and that's what I do. That's what I do now. But I do collaborations with Justice for Family and Renewed Minds of New Jersey. Um, a criminal justice major, um, and right now I'm just focused on just giving everything I can give to people that came from my situation, the worst of situation, or nothing close to my situation, but to be an outlet. You no, know, not to be a mentor or anything other than that. So I just want to be an outlet. I want to be, you know that door that that juvenile need or that person that that juvenile needs to open the door to give them a brighter future or a better path because I never had a mother or father or nobody to really even show me regular morals of life. I learned everything on my own. So I want to be able to be there to help somebody through a situation that came from something that I came from. And Shabazz is serving as an outlet for many youth, not only at home in New Jersey, but nationwide. He's now traveled the country, participating in community organization and leadership training, and sharing his story at events like Georgetown University's Ending Mass Incarceration event and the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative's most recent national conference. Shabazz's is just one story of the thousands, but it illustrates the impact that family members and other caring adults have on the lives of young people involved with the justice system. The work Ryan, Grace, Tracy, Shabazz, and countless others are doing is dedicated to ensuring more youth who come into contact with the justice system don't experience the harsh circumstances Corey and Shabazz went through. It's focused on making sure justice systems embrace families as equal partners in the care of youth in the system, and on making sure families are prepared to serve as those partners. Overall, their work aims to usher in a new era for juvenile justice, in which systems and families work together to meet the needs of children and youth in ways that best prepare them for successful futures. We want to thank Ryan, Grace, Tracy, and Shabazz for sharing their experiences with us. Ryan and Grace have joined us this afternoon to answer your questions in our extra credit portion of the program. But before we turn to that, I want to remind everyone that this program will be archived on our website at neglected-delinquent.org. There you'll find additional information and resources, including parts of our conversations with our guests we didn't have time to share today. Thank you all again for joining, and we hope you'll stick around for extra credit.